My name is Ross McElroy. I'm the president and CEO of Fission Uranium Corp. Um, Fission Uranium Corp is a, a uranium developer. We have the PLS project in Canada's Athabasca Basin in northern Saskatchewan. Uh, the, the advanced project has just completed a feasibility study on it, and um, and so we're we're moving obviously the project towards uh, which which we believe has the potential to be a, a, an eventual producer. So great, Ross. Thank you very much for the introduction. Good to meet you. Um, <clears throat> PLS Patterson Lake South. Uh, I sometimes think of it as Triple R. Is, is you know how did, how what's the difference between PLS and Triple R? Was it, did it's a, a name rebrand or a name change? No, not at all. Uh, PLS is the project name, um, so it's really the you know the overall land package, which is uh, you know something north of thirty thousand hectares of uh, of, um, of titled land that we have. Um, the deposit name itself is Triple R, so it's that. That's really what the distinction is. Okay, and um, the feasibility study is is addressing um, a small amount of the PLS project. It's addressing the Triple R deposit. It, indeed, it really is. It, it's the Triple R deposit itself, and then of course the ground immediately surrounding it, where the you know the various mine infrastructure will be, including the tailings management facility. So it's a much more localized area within the overall PLS project. Got it. Right. Um, So the feasibility study, uh, I I will want to kind of drill down into the details, but perhaps could you just give me an overview of what you see as this kind of the salient highlights of of that feasibility study, which came out last week, I believe? Yeah, I think what it does, um, it confirms, obviously, that we have a very substantial, large, high-grade deposit, um, unique, uh, in that it's near surface. I guess we've known that all the way along. Didn't need a feasibility study to tell us that it's near surface, but it does give us uh, certain advantages over a number of other projects. But the, the feasibility study itself, I think, is is confirmation of all the steps we've taken along the way since discovery, building up, up the deposit, delineating it. We've actually brought in more resources into the um, feasibility study itself than where we had done the, the previous um, economic study, the pre-feasibility study back in 2019. So it's, it's growing with, in respect to that. Uh, I think the feasibility is obviously a higher level of, of data and information um, on the overall resource, on the overall mine plan, uh, a better estimate on, on costs and uh, you know, and 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 the whole plan going forward. So. Let's let's focus on costs because we all know that we're living through a period of high inflation. Uh, when you look at the Q4 numbers from the major um, operators, they're seeing capex up twenty percent, operating costs up twenty percent. This is on top of what they were expecting. Um, how did you? How did you? Uh, the, the feasibility study was done by Tetra Tech. Um, how did they price this? Because concrete, steel fuel, there's so much fluctuation in prices. It must have been a difficult thing to get a a proper baseline on. Well, not only fluctuation, but exactly what you highlighted, inflationary uh, environment that we've been in the last couple of years. I mean, the number of those costs of those items um, are up substantially, uh, you know, in some cases, uh, you know, 100%. um, You know, uh, and I think that um, where that's reflected, uh, a lot of the inflationary numbers are even are in our opex, of which we'll we'll discuss later. The cash operating costs, um, which have have gone up, and I think there you you can obviously see inflation at work in those numbers. Um, on the capex side, we were uh, you know very um, pleased with the results. Between you know over the last three years, we were actually um, slightly, I mean marginally less than what we had. Um, uh, as figured in the in the pre feasibility study, um, which so you know I mean it's essentially considered flat, being between where we were in 2019 where we are now in an inflationary environment. That tells you that we've made some substantial changes and improvements, um, you know, between the pre feasibility study and and now. And uh, you know I think that um, yes, yeah, but so in I what have, area? Because I, I I saw that there's the the uh, capex hasn't changed, and yet I know that there's been huge inflation. So you must have reconfigured somehow. Yeah. Well, there's a few things I think that that stand out. Um, one of the things, uh, Highway 955, that that runs up from the north and and uh, just to the side of, or sorry, 
runs up from the south and to the, the side of our deposit area. That basically connects um, our project area with the major uh, centers, you know, population centers to the south. Um, in the pre-feasibility study, we were going to reroute the highway around the, uh, uh, once you got up near the tailings management facility, we were going to loop the highway around, um, back around the project area. And uh, so it did uh, require, you know, a few kilometers of rerouting a highway. That's something we've eliminated and saw that as um, a necessary step um, right away when we began our feasibility study. So in, in other words, we'll leave the highway, plan to leave the highway where it is and rather control uh, mine, mine equipment, trucks and that, uh, you know, at the intersections. Um, it's just, a, it's a easy, smart fix that, that uh, actually saved an awful lot of money. So no more rerouting the highway. We're still keeping the, the infrastructure where it was it's just that it'll be a controlled access uh, across. There's not a highly uh, trafficked area on, on the highway anyways. You know, it's considered a highway, but, um, you know, you might have one vehicle, one recreation vehicle cross it, you know, maybe once or twice a day. I mean, it's not exactly a high-use highway that way. Um, yeah. That's That was one area that uh, I think there's some immediate savings in. Um, we've changed the, uh, the decline, um, I guess the access point, you know, it was um, coming in at a different angle. You know, there's just, uh, there's some some changes in that, that that I think were, you know, just in the overall uh, decline design that, that managed to save us some money. Some other parts too, I think that are quite notable. Um, we, in the pre-feasibility study, we we were actually buying all of the mine equipment. So, you know, they were capital outlay of cash. So, um, we're now, uh, you know, looking at leasing equipment as opposed to buying it. So, you know, you you are taking a number of those costs and moving it, you know, further into the operations side rather than initial capex at the at the outlay. So, I think you know those are are some of the key elements in there. But there were a number of of efficiencies. But yeah, you're right. We were working also not only changing things, designing it, but you've also had the inflationary uh, pressures working at you and it, the the end result for us was really uh, you know staying about the same. So I think that was uh, an extremely positive change between the the pre feasibility and feasibility. Uh, I saw the the sustaining capex increase um, quite substantially. You know, it's it's, it's quite a higher um, it, it goes from two hundred and something to three hundred and close to four hundred million dollars in, in sustaining capex. It, it, it is, is that part of that kind of um, the, the 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 same concept as the leasing you know you're just you're deferring deferring costs where possible to reduce the upfront cost indeed i think that that's a that's a pretty uh a good observation i think that's that that's correct so you know in essence i mean if you looked at, at both the um the initial capex and sustaining you know we're slightly higher uh on the feasibility study than than the, the pre-feasibility study so um you know that that's uh, that's that's been the, the net result, but the initial capex is what's really you know been able to substantially almost more or less stay the same. So combine the two, we're slightly slightly above where we were in the pre fees, and that's really the you know the function of uh, of inflation, but to a marginal um, effect rather than you know the thirty or forty percent that a lot of people were expecting. And did you use uh, sixty five dollars per pound uranium in the? pre-feasibility study as well as in this feasibility study? Yeah, so we use $50 uranium uh, in a pre-feasibility study. That was done in 2019. Remember, uranium prices were trading uh, in the low $30, I think, at that time, 2019. You know, the the projections, I mean, this, what you're working on is a projection. Where will the uranium prices be at the time of production or, you know, what? and, uh, and there's a number of... Uh, you know, places that they get this this sort of information from the you know the trends of prices of commodities. Um, so, anyways, the the pre feasibility was done at fifty dollar uranium. Well, we're already at fifty dollar uranium. You know, three years later, the the price of uranium that we use in the pre feasibility. Well, that's the spot price that currently in the in the market right now. Um, I, you know, I think the consensus out there by Pretty much anybody that measures these things is uh, feels six is sixty five dollars and higher. 
Um, I think we chose a um, relatively conservative number at $65. If you, you know, you look at projections of, of the price of uranium in the next five or six years, um, you know, that that's really where we're where we're aiming at. There were other, you know, precedent, other feasibility studies that had been done um, in the latter part of 2022 using similar $65 uranium. And I think that, you know, anybody doing a study right now um, would probably be, be using similar numbers. It's funny, isn't it? Uranium is such a, an anomaly of an industry because if you did that in gold or in base metals, you'd get slaughtered, <laughs> you know. Picking picking a metal price which is thirty percent above spot. I mean, it's 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 particular to uranium. It, it is, but you know, I bet it it is borne out in the in the overall um, trend of the prices. And you know, there's a lot of thought that goes into these forward projections. You know, supply demand um, equations. Where, where's the uranium coming from? And uh, you know, all of the experts have been predicting the the surge in uranium prices. And in fact. It's got an awful long way to go. We we feel, um, you know, if you just uh, just speaking general macro terms away from the project area, just the overall incentive price, you know, globally for uranium it is headed north of ninety dollars a hundred, you know, somewhere a hundred dollar um, a pound uranium in order to put most projects into production. And we know the demand is growing in, in nuclear and electricity, and uh, it, it's pretty. Um, straightforward to see that there's a you know the, the overall trend is still northward on the price of uranium so we're to, to relate back to your your question yes we um we we are projecting higher prices uh at, at the time of the of the you know that we're in production and we've uh, chosen 65 and feel that's a, a a pretty reliable um and airing on the conservative side rather than than uh than and stretching it out Good. Going back to one of your earlier comments, you called it a large deposit. Um, I, I know there's over 100 million pounds of um, contained uh, U308 in there. It, it's not super large. I mean, it's not hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds. Um, um, are you going to work on expanding the resource or, or is the next phase continuing to kind of work in and de-risk the current resource? You know, there, there's two things that go hand in hand with that statement. I mean, it is large, over, you know, 130, you know, as a global resource, we're about 130 million pounds. The majority of it is drilled at, um, at the higher levels. So we have indicated and, and built mine reserves of 93, 90, almost 94 million pounds. Um, there's there's substantial growth on the on the the deposit itself right now. Uh, the the overall makeup of the triple R deposit is that there's five zones. They're all um, they kind of I don't know. Imagine them as pearls in a necklace. Uh, they're, they're similar depth elevation to each other, but they're on strike. There's there's five separate zones over around a three kilometer strike uh, length total. Um, the Feasibility study is done on the three zones, the three inside zones. Um, the main zone is the R780. The uh, smaller, in fact, the discovery zone is the R00 East zone. Um, what's new in the feasibility is that we brought in uh, a lot of the resources from the R840 West zone. That was not part of the um, pre-feasibility study because at the time, Three years ago, we didn't have the drill hole density to um, to have indicated resources that we uh, that are necessary for um, doing the advanced economic studies on. So, um, but that still leaves the two satellite zones on either side of the um, the, the feasibility, the mine plan, I suppose. So we have the you know the uh, the sixteen twenty east zone, um, which is about two hundred meters to the uh, to, to the east of the R780, and then on the west side we have the 1580. That's uh, that's just it's about 500 meters or so away from the the, the current mine plan uh, of the 840 zone. So there's great um, uh, there's still I think substantial growth in those to be able to add in those two zones into the overall deposit. But not only that, within each zone themselves. They're they're not closed off. The R seven eighty zone is still open. Uh, it's open at plunge. It's open at depth. Um, we know we see mineralization several hundred meters below the the drilling. Not a lot of drill holes down there, so really no resources to to build off of at this point. But you know mineralization is there. So I think future drilling and probably from underground 
workings would would uh, expand um, our known mineralized area, but also uh, along down along plunge to the east, so maybe you know that comes in beneath the sixteen twenty zone. There, uh, that's still open as well. So, and the eight forty drilling that we we completed in two thousand twenty one really opened up that zone. We thought it was fairly closed off at the time before we did uh, the additional 25 holes into the 840. But as it turned out, uh, it opened up a whole new area where we think there's, um, you know, a lot more high grade uh, mineralization to be had at depth and well, probably more at depth, but working yourself down to the, um, to the Eastern side of, of the 840. So, they're wide open for, for further growth. In, in, in your Q4 presentation, you talk about a number of um, kind of 45 uh, drill holes, kind of, um, and kind of a new program going into the, the two of the zones which you've included in the pre-feasibility, sorry, into the feasibility study, the, um, the 840 West and the 780 East. Um, are, are those holes in the feasibility or study or are those kind of, are those to come to grow the resource? Uh, as in, will there be a resource update on the on when you have the results of those holes, the majority of, and the results are all in now. Um, the majority of those forty five holes, in other words, forty four of those forty five were used in the um, in the feasibility study. We had uh, uh, disclosed a, a new resource estimate back in September of two thousand twenty two that included all of these holes, and so it was that new updated resource that was used in the feasibility study. Uh, I'll note the one hole that wasn't used in because we didn't have the assays for, but really we're not didn't want to wait any longer. Um, they were it was one of the metallurgical holes. Um, you know, with the the purpose of drilling that hole in the first place was for metallurgical uh, uh, material rather than just straight assays. Um, uh, but that was uh, you know still one of the best holes in the property that that hadn't yet uh, on the R840. West Zone. It was the fourth hole of the metallurgical um, series on the 840 that, you know, and it produced, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, but something in the order of, um, you know, 50 meters of uh, some, you know, almost 19% type material. It was, you know, pretty substantial, maybe not quite that high, but it was, um, it was really, uh, you know, uh, it had a GT, I think, of around 600 or almost 700. Um, so, I mean, it was, it was a Pretty phenomenal hole, but that wasn't used in the in the resource estimate. One single hole isn't going to make an, an, an awful lot of difference for a, a resource and in the mine plan, so it was excluded because we just didn't have the assays and wanted to get marching on the um, on the feasibility completion of feasibility. Um, now, as I understand it, the, um, these are structural kind of subvertical um, features with plunges down um, along the, um, the, the the plane. Um, th that resource that you published in early September. Uh, it was mostly indicated with a small amount of inferred. Uh, normally, when I see a feasibility study being published, there's measured and indicated, and there's actually there there are quite chunky zones which have got a lot of infill, which you can categorize into the measured category. Um, I, I I saw the jump that goes from uh, indicated inferred to three million tons of it was it was I think um, two point seven million tons of indicated and point six. 4 million tons of inferred and then it goes to 3 million tons of probable reserves um talk me through that because it doesn't quite kind of i i can't follow those steps well the i mean the the, the goal of the drilling um that we did the 45 holes was really to do straight conversion from inferred to indicated and that is just a function of drill hole density you know in our, in our case in other words we're looking to in these types of deposits, you have to have uh, fairly close space drilling because a lot changes on these high grade deposits in a very short uh, distance, um, particularly on strike because they have a long depth um, uh, component to them, but you know, very, very short strike. Um, so we, you almost have to drill it at about 15 meter centers, 15 to, you know, 15 to 20 meter centers in order to have indicated. Um, very difficult to do uh, drilling that's even tighter than that, certainly from, from surface, um, because, you know, you're, you're looking at holes that'll wander 
over you know the course of a uh, you know a, a whole trajectory of a couple hundred meters and you know to, to pinpoint targeting within you know five to ten meters very very you can do it but it's 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 difficult um, but I think we we've had a, a very good track record at conversion of of inferred to indicate it almost on a one to one basis so I think that's pretty good I think it does tell us that we understand the geometry of the deposit quite well and you're right the the main controls are vertical the the mineralization tends to be along um, vertically dipping stratigraphic uh, horizon so you've got graphitic graphitic zones that basically parallel uh, different contacts in in there quite steeply and the, and the mineralization the highest grade mineralization follows right on those fault planes there bleeds outwards around them but um so I, I think that was really I don't know if I'm answering your question, but the the drilling of uh, you know from inferred to indicated really w was just getting um, the the drill hole density down to the degree that we're about 15 meters between um, between intersections, and that's at that point um, yeah. statistics tell us that we're uh, you know in, in the indicated and stuff that we can use economic studies on. So that was really how that changed within the range of your semi varigam of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> good, 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 good. Um, so that probably means that you're going to need to do some more underground drilling when you eventually get the development up, um, up and running. Um, but that's that's um, relatively standard. So um, and your, your mining method is long hole open stoping. You've got four meter uh, wide and 20 meter long um, stopes. Um, conventional process and you've got two ventilation shafts because of course this high grade mineralization you need to uh, get that air circulating and minimize worker ex exposure in uh, duration and time um, uh, and proximity do you is there going to be any remote um, working uh, you know or is it no no we don't we don't uh, foresee that here this is all fairly just con conventional underground mining um, you know, and I think uh, a few things attest to that. We're in, um, you know, if you look at uh, some of the mines operating in the Athabasca, and I'll just, you know, use, say, MacArthur River and Cigar, which are the two present uh, operating mines. So there's a certain degree and quite a bit of, of uh, remote mining, I guess, robotics, people refer to it as, but it's basically remote mining without people exposed down there. But the rock conditions are quite different there as well. They're deeper. It, and both of those deposits are higher grade for one thing. And so you're always surrounded by much higher grade resource, but also uh, rock conditions that are um, essentially, they're not, they're not great on those uh, operations. That's just, just the nature of the, you know, sandstone um, and high alteration uh, uh, scenario. And with ours, we're a basement host, hundred percent basement hosted deposit so um we just by its very nature the basement crystalline basement rock is is uh, not as permeable as it is in the sandstone um and so you end up with a lot stronger rock conditions better rock conditions um so from a safety perspective you know our rocks will hold up um we are able to uh, to mine in conventional conventional means, so we don't have to do remote mining. And with the air uh, circulation, as you said, and shallow, you know, all these things factor into the you know the, the us using being able to use um, conventional mining and, and not have to go on to the remote side. Good, thank you. A really helpful explanation. Um, can we just look at the timing of what the next steps are, what you're planning uh, the next six, 12 months, possibly longer? Sure. Well, now that the economic study is um, done, uh, you know, our next big step is on, on the overall regulatory side. And that would be um, our next phase is to enter environmental impact assessment, um, which we get into in a meaningful way, projected uh, to begin that process um, I mean, we're already sort of doing it now, but you really don't get into it in a, in a, in a big formal way until about Q3 of, um, of 2023. So we entered into the, the precursor phase of that, which is called the environmental assessment phase. Um, back in the, uh, 
in the fall of 2000, or sorry, in December 2021. And that, um, that was where we filed our project uh, description to the provincial and federal regulators. Um, within that, we, you know, they, it's basically saying that this project, you know, we, it's advanced and we continue, we intend to continue to take it to, um, you know, along, along the pathway to production. Um, so within that, we wanted to complete feasibility study. Because obviously you're ramping up on the, uh, on the permitting regulatory side and, and start to get, uh, you know, build our relationships with our Northern communities. Um, so we've completed, uh, um, so now the feasibility study is completed. And also on the community side, on the, the rights holders and stakeholder side, we've signed six key capacity and funding agreements with our um, with our local indigenous groups that that have you know claim to the Patterson Lake area. So I think there's a great deal of support from that, and those are all uh, from the from the local people. But those are all aspects that go into our next big phase, the environmental assessment uh, or impact assessment. So you know, Q3, that's the next big step. That takes approximately 24 to 36 months to successfully move through that, um, assuming that, you know, you, you not too many head, uh, hiccups along the way through that process. Um, and coming out of the EIS, or the Environmental Impact Assessment um, phase, you will receive licenses to build and, and operate. So our timelines, just looking at a big picture, uh, we get into the EIS later in 2023, come out of it by 2025, 26. Um, and, and at that point, we're able to begin construction. Uh, and uh, as we noted in the, um, in the, I think in the, in the news release, it's about a three year period from construction until we're producing asset. So towards 28, 29 uh, timeline before ore is coming out of the ground. And, and this is a, you know, a cash flow going the other way. And um, we, all, we all welcome those moments. In addition to the environmental work, are you going to be doing regional exploration in, uh, on, on the wider project area? Um, you know, have you got a budget? Uh, first of all, what's your cash position and, and how much of that are you going to be allocating to regional exploration or ongoing technical work? Sure. So our cash position, um, we were a little, uh, about 40, $41 million at the end of um, 2022, so December 31st. Um, so a healthy cash position, and that's with a feasibility study done. So that's, you know, we're, we do have a, a, a pretty reasonable um, treasury at this point. All of that money right now is being allocated towards um, advanced engineering, um, you know, and, and procurement studies that we and work that we need to do uh, over the next two to three years. Um, I do uh, probably want to begin exploration um, work again. I think that that's very soon in the cards. No, I don't have the budget for that at the moment. Um, but we, I think 2023 will be a year where, you know, Fission does start picking up on, on exploration. And, and some of that can be just continued drilling on the, on the zones. Um, but I also think that we've got a great deal of potential on strike on the Patterson Lake corridor. And not only that, but on parallel targets to the, to the south. So, you know, it's been a number of years since we were really doing any meaningful exploration work. The last bit that we did highlighted a few areas um, to the south of the deposit that I'm quite confident, uh, you know, that this would be an area that we could put more attention to and perhaps make, you know, new new discoveries. Um, the, the the budget's not there yet, but we are, you know, looking at, at, um, at doing some exploration 23, which means I probably want to raise additional funds in order to do that exploration. I, I, I want to keep the capital that we do have right now towards the advanced uh, work on the project necessary in the permitting side. Um, so any exploration money will be addition to what we have right now. Um, the Lassonde curve is a, is a powerful um, kind of feature in, in, in the resources sector. You know, lots of people take a lot of credence on it. Um, 
And they would say, many people might say, well, you've done the feasibility study. Now I've just got to wait until they do their, they've got their final, their, their construction permit. And then I'll kind of, I can buy in then, which is, you know, four or five years away. Um, um, what's, what's the, uh, what's the impetus for investors to want to get in now? Well, I think we, part of what we were just talking about, expiration number one, um, I, I think we have, you know, tremendous opportunity to, to uh, expand on our PLS project. Um, you know, the if you look at just how deposits occur in, in this type of setting, uh, you know, you can use the the much more mature uh, eastern side of the, the basin where you see just a number of, of deposits that occur in a in an area. Once you're in a prospective area, you end up with multiple deposits on trends. We're starting to see that same pattern out in the western side of the basin. Um, you know, within a couple of kilometers, you start seeing, you know, bang, 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 bang along, along prospective trends. We have so much prospective ground on our property and, and already some, you know, hints that there's, there's mineralization, you know, yet to be found. There's certainly large scale hydrothermal alteration, which is your first key towards finding things. So I think the impetus there is that we, there's still a great deal of potential success with exploration. Um, there's a, the overall uranium market, which just continues to get better and better and better. And as the commodity price increases, you know, these people, development projects such as ours will um, continue to garner headlights, uh, sort of headlines and, um, and uh, you know, I think fall in, in, in favor of investors. There's M&A activity um, that, that's starting to occur in this in this uh, business, I think to a great deal, we saw a lot of activity even in the Athabasca Basin in um, you know 2022. Uh, in a good uranium market, I think you can expect to see more of that kind of activity out there. So you know those are three powerful uh, uh, different reasons for wanting to you know own a own a company such as Fission. And I think it's one of the very few uh, projects that you know that's in this development phase that, that can be, um, you know, a, a major contributor to production uranium in the, you know, in, in, in the near future. So um, I think that uh, anybody that's looking at, you know, getting involved in the uranium sector, you know, you, I think you want to take a look at development projects. You want to take a look at, you know, their exploration projects as well and, and operating mines. But I think there's, uh, you know, there, there's room in there for all, all such companies. Uh, I see you've got uh, about 50, 53, 50, uh, 50 um, or so percent uh, institutions. Is that a who's who of everybody who's or, already interested in uranium? Or, uh, you know, uh, is, is there more of an audience to speak to? Are you having any success with generalists or people who are new to the uranium story? Yeah, I think I think so. You know, I, one of the evolutions we've seen in the in the company just over the last, say, two to three years has been um, a much more... Uh, solid and broad institutional shareholdings. You know, if I showed you our registry back in 2020, I think we were roughly 90% retail, um, 10% institutional. Um, it's it's much more balanced now, which I think is healthier. Um, I think we're starting to see more and more uh, institutional type ownership and, and interest in, in the company. Um, so, you know, I think that, uh, but we are seeing, you know, that, that tends to be more of the sticky money, we'll say, in, in, in investors having institutionals in a development um, size company like this, I think is key. But one of the aspects that we're looking at doing, um, we haven't mentioned here, and I've, I haven't really been too vocal about it yet, but we are looking at uh, likely doing a U.S. listing um, this year in, in the company, and you know what that would would do is, is certainly broaden our investor horizon out there. Tapping, you know, we're already listed on the OTC, but having a U.S. listing, I think, um, gives you just better access to to a lot more capital, and I think that would certainly attract more more people. But you know, I would say we're getting the whole plethora of, of investors, um, interest by different institutional, the generalists, um, so obviously retail people seem to be migrating towards the, the, the uranium sector. But I think anybody that follows it closely um, is really uh, 
quite appreciative of the of the new kind of renaissance going on right now and um, and looking for brand names in, in that sector to, to own and I think vision is is definitely one of those brand names. Uh, even my kids and my my family, my wife, uh, uh, have up to here with uranium as I preach to them. Um, but um, <clears throat> when you put out a feasibility study, you must, of course, look towards financing and building. Um, the, the the capex is one point one billion. Um, have you your market caps uh, three fifty five US or thereabouts? Um, what are your thoughts? You know, do you do, that? There's I mean, quite often when there's a company which is trading at a significant discount, I guess um, the market capitalization at a um, a fraction of its NPV. There's a the, there's a conversation around selling part or all of the asset. Um, and then there are also conversations around debt, equity, and metal. You know, streaming and royalties, and you know, what, what, what's the conversation like inside the uh, um, in, inside the boardroom? Well, well, first of all, I think it's useful to keep to the same currency. So we're talking uh, on um, capex. We're you know when we we're talking about the one point call it one point one five one point two billion initial capex. That's Canadian dollars. So. Our market cap, uh, you know, that's fine. Our market cap is a, is around six hundred, a little north of six hundred million dollars um, there right now, which is still half of the uh, half of the capex, but it's not a, a, a third or a quarter of the of the capex um, required. I think uh, you know, they, obviously, uh, this, these are going to be important years for us, two thousand twenty three and twenty four. Um, towards you know having an eye on how does project financing happen, and that can uh, take a number of, of different ways. Um, I think there will be some of it will be debt debt uh, financing. Some you know a portion will probably be equity. I think we'll start looking at um, possibly forward. You know there might be some forward selling. Uh, you know getting contracts in place with with utilities is certainly one of the potential avenues to um, to growth, and this is something you know. I think uh, we're starting to see more and more interest for utilities, not only uh, you know globally, I suppose, but um, specifically in North America, um, looking to have access to to uh, resources in, in companies that they believe can can deliver. And I think now that we're done the feasibility study, I think that you know we can start looking towards some of those arrangements. Um, little bit more meaningful. I think we were a little too far out even last year, time-wise, and also from where we were in the project with a pre-feasibility study to get too serious with uh, with those sort of conversations. But I think as we move forward in 23, 24, I, I think that there will be, um, you know, starting to have meaningful discussions with utilities. Um, and, and that will provide, you know, some definitely the, the power for us to be able to to finance the project, knowing that you actually have a buyer and how much they'll be paying for uranium. That's certainly one avenue. Um, I see it as sort of a, a, a basket of, of, of ability to sell your uranium, some of it on spot, some of it on um, shorter term contracts, some of it on larger term. But, you know, I think these are something I don't have an answer to right at the moment, but it is something that we're really going to be focusing on this calendar year and 24. So. Uh, look to me to, uh, to be, you know, putting my, you know, my work in rolling the sleeves up on on how we're getting through pro project financing this uh, coming up. Thank you. Yeah, no, I absolutely, I wasn't expecting kind of a finished article. It was, it was, it was simply just to uh, understand what the conversation was, and uh, you've outlined that that very neatly. Um, Ross, thank you so much for your time. Um, I've, it's been a it's been a a, a really interesting uh, update on the feasibility study and the company. Um, I look forward to seeing how things progress, and I very much look forward to seeing the exploration starting again uh, on the wider uh, portfolio because I think that that'll certainly um, spice things up. And it, it, um, as good as the deposit is, it's always nice to show that there's uh, scope for it to be much larger and, and the the famous words a district play. Good. Thank you very much, Merlin.